Case number three, I can't take big meals. This is a doctor's wife, aged 37, and she got abdominal pain about an hour after meals. Had endoscopy done, was normal, nothing to find. But it was quite severe, abdominal pain, as you heard from our chairman in one of his earlier patients. What did she have? She had celiac artery stenosis. And this shows a focal narrowing at the origin of the celiac artery. And again, how, how keen research registrar Shiri Sengl has collected 57 such cases when I made this slide. And we see these focal narrowings, presumably thrombosis, which has recanalized. Um, about half the cases in our series were symptomatic, but apparently there's a good collateral, so um, in some patients that they don't get the abdominal angina after big meals. And I just remind you that the gut is associated with APS as well. Certainly gastric ischemia or gut ischemia, uh, angina. We see celiac disease or perhaps celiac sensitivities in some of our patients, notably those with either thyroid or particularly with Sjogren's. And interestingly, we've got a small collection, this is very odd, of Crohn's disease, who've got positive anticardiolipin antibodies. Don't understand it because Crohn's is not your normal autoimmune type <coughs> disease, but we're seeing that. The kidney also gets focal lesions, and this is a, a girl with uh, hypertension, variable blood pressure, levido reticularis, and quite marked focal uh, uh, arterial disease in the kidney. So this was a paper we, we published some years ago, fluctuating blood pressures, renal artery stenosis, and the antiphospholipid syndrome. The kidney, of course, can also be affected by major vein thrombosis, as in this girl I showed in the picture, but also microvascular thrombosis. And in the world of lupus, one of the reasons for biopsying now is to look for little clotting disease in these biopsies, as well as inflammatory nephritis. So the lessons are here, cerebral artery disease, renal artery stenosis, celiac artery stenosis, these are all features that we see, and this gives rise to more intensive looks at whether anticoagulation is the right treatment for some of these patients. Case number four, tinnitus. This is an older patient, 61, who had a stroke, a DVT, severe migraine, developed severe ataxia, and hearing loss, and tinnitus. And MRI of the brain showed those dots that I showed earlier. Dots which absolutely require anticoagulation. Focal lesions and ultimately, of course, absolutely vital warfarin. And what was interesting, on warfarin, her ataxia improved, which we see. But what was very odd, and this was new to us, the tinnitus disappeared. And her tinnitus remains, she's a, again a very intelligent observer, whenever the INR falls below 3.1, it's very specific. And we have a small collection like this where they know their INR and tinnitus is the symptom. What's the lesson? The lesson here is that the ENT doctors are probably seeing it and we're being referred patients with many ears and balance disorders, vertigo, ataxia, as presentations of APS. So the clinical spectrum broadens again. Tinnitus, which is one of the most untreatable lesions known to man, occasionally responding in, in these patients. Case number five, family headaches. This is an, uh, an old boy, well, 50, 67, intermittent claudication. And now he comes from a poor part of London. I don't know if you know, the old Kent Road, which is down the back of St. Thomas's. And he was dragged up to clinic by his daughter. Intermittent claudication, headaches, migraine. Non-smoker, however, and what about other risk factors? Um, 
He, he comes from the old Kent Road, which those of you who don't know it is the, the poorest place on the map and uh, as of 60 pounds in, in, in monopoly terms. But what we found in this man, which, you know, a daily patient, you see these patients every day of the year, uh, a chap with vascular disease, he had very high anticardiolipin levels, 90 units of IgG. He was beta-2 antibody positive. Brain showed focal lesions, quite a few of them. Doppler showed severe vascular disease, peripheral vascular. So what, what do you think it was? Was this just an ordinary chap, non-smoker, however, with vascular disease? Or was there a link with antiphospholipid? So what, what did we do? We asked him about his family. Anyone in your family with anything similar? No, no, doc, no, nothing wrong with my family. And his daughter, who accompanied him, said, come on, dad, come on. Um, this is what he had in his family. He's, he's one of, I think, 14 siblings. Grandmother stroke migraine, mother migraine stroke, aunt migraine multiple sclerosis, 14 sibs, five with migraine, four with DVT, four with stroke, two with multiple sclerosis, and uh, two with uh, APS, one of whom was my patient, and that's why she dragged dad along to the clinic. What is this patient teaching us? Well, first of all, as we've talked about today already, migraine and stroke, such a link, uh, and possibly one of the major missing links. But this family may be teaching us something about the genetics of antiphospholipid syndrome. At the time that this man came to us, we had a visiting professor actually at St. Thomas's, Michael Hayden, who was the head of genetics in the University of Vancouver. And he, I'm not a geneticist, but he quoted, if you have a one family of 14 siblings and half of them have your particular disease, that in, in itself would be sufficient to identify the APS gene. It's interesting because we see many family patients, many families with APS. And here's one such family. Dear Dr. Hughes, Mrs. Williams, despite a history of migraine, low platelets, previous infarct, all tests for APS are negative. Her sister, who has APS, has responded to anticoagulation should we follow suit? Of course you should. This patient is seronegative and she has APS. She was treated with heparin to start with. She's on warfarin now. She's A1, no headaches, doing well. What's the patient teaching us? Well, this Williams family, just an example, she had four siblings. Peter, age 50, had migraine, levido reticularis, pulmonary embolism, but all antiphospholipid testing was negative. Jane, 48, migraine, pulmonary embolus, MS, was interesting. She only had IgA APL, which people don't routinely test, perhaps. Alison, memory loss, pulmonary embolus, who died, antiphospholipid, known positive. And Susan, uh, headaches, DVT, again was negative and was tested in South Africa where she returned to and they found she only had IgA antiphospholipid. So here's a family with four siblings and the patient, five of them, with, with features of APS, some APL negative, some APL positive. Very interestingly, this lady was an EEG technician and she told us that when she was training, she, she tested her siblings just to practice, and they all showed temporal lobe epilepsy. <laughs> what are the lessons? Well, I think pretty obvious, really. Genetic factors probably play a part, as they do in all, auto as in lupus, as in thyroid, etc. I think temporal lobe epilepsy, which has been alluded to here, is a feature that we see amongst others of the brain. And maybe there are some patients where the conventional three tests don't pick up. So if you're a geneticist, you don't just look for thrombosis. You've got to look for the wider non-thrombotic manifestations. <laughs>